One thing that makes me really happy about this channel is that many authors get in touch with me directly and share their stories with me. Which is, you know, really nice because it means they trust me to do a good job of narrating their work. To facilitate this further, I opened a subreddit, Dr. Creepen's Vault. And many of you have been kind enough to leave your stories there. I can't guarantee that I'll narrate all of them, but I definitely do read each and every one. And I do my best to add them to the channel as and when I get a chance. Tonight's story is an example of one of these, and a very interesting one at that. So, sit back and relax with your favourite drinks, my dear friends. Because now it's time to listen. It was a Friday night, during the first week of a four-week remodeling job in a rather remote house. I was working with a few other guys, six in all, most of whom were from farther out of town than I was. They decided to spend the duration of the job, about a month, living at the house. I, however, decided that the drive back to Pittsburgh wasn't far enough to keep me in the old, empty house all weekend. One of the workers, a man named Jim, who was friends with the man that had recently purchased the house, happened to live in the area. He gave me directions, which he said would shave half an hour off of my drive time. But they went through the mountains. I had no intention of following these directions, deciding instead to be safe and stick with the way I already knew. However, that night, when it was time to leave, all of the men were sitting out on the front porch of the house, facing the narrow driveway. Jim gave me a brief verbal recap of the directions as I made my way down the front steps and to my car. Pulling out of the driveway, with Jim watching, I felt obligated to go left, the way his directions led, rather than right, which was the way I knew. As I headed out onto the dark forest road, with the trees crowding in on all sides, I told myself that I'd just drive a few minutes down the road, turn around and then go the other way. I realised, however, that Jim and the other guys would see me then, and damn my foolish pride, I didn't want that. I resolved to give the directions a shot. The directions said that after about twenty minutes of driving, I would come to a huge, squat little tree, which leaned across the road at an intersection with a tiny dirt road. After about thirty minutes, I came across the sight, both relieving and horrifying at the same time. On my right, the tree tore out of the ground, a huge gnarled trunk with long, crooked fingers like a rotted corpse reaching out of the grave to strangle whatever it could get its hands on. Accordingly, the trees on the other side of the road, that the corpse tree seemed determined to get in its twisted bony grasp, all shied away from the road, as if recoiling in horror. Warily, I made the right at the intersection, onto the dirt road. The way was more grass than dirt, for the most part, it was two tire tracks worn through a section of the forest, in which the trees had been cut back a bit, likely long ago. It was a cart path, more sorted to a horse-drawn buggy than my 2000 Corolla. According to the directions, I was only to be on the trail for 10 to 15 minutes. After only a few minutes, however, the path became somewhat treacherous. In the tire tracks there began to appear deep ruts, some filled with water. I had to slow down to avoid damaging my car, but still go fast enough that I wouldn't get stuck in the mud. I carefully crept along through this terrible trail, the tall grass hissing like a deadly snake on the underside of the car. I could almost feel its breath on my feet. Every once in a while, a tree branch would reach out and run a finger along the side of the car, joining in with the hissing. These woods were poisonous. 
Suddenly, something flashed in front of the car, darting from one side of the narrow path to the other, briefly illuminated in the headlights. It jerked along the ground as if it were being dragged all, like a snake even, a huge white snake with the face of a human. I couldn't believe it. I didn't dare. Did I really see that? I could have sworn that, for an instant, an incredibly brief instant, I had locked eyes with something human. As the thing, whatever it was, erupted from the brush along the roadside, I instinctively slammed on the brakes. Now, my mind was reeling at the thought of what my eyes believed they'd seen. I didn't see much of the body, and couldn't understand how it moved across the road in such a manner. But whatever it was, had certainly been looking at me, straight into my eyes. Had it been laughing? My mind was numb. I didn't even realize that I'd stopped the car, until I heard the knocking. It came once, three distinct raps on the driver's side of the car, near the rear tire, just a few feet behind my left shoulder. I wasn't even aware I'd heard it at first, I was so dazed. But then it came again, and I was forced to notice. A long silence followed, and then something bumped along on the underneath of the car the sound reverberating through my feet, along with a sound like the hissing of the grass. But this time, the car wasn't moving. <sighs> the car is still, I told myself, suddenly aware that, indeed, something was happening around me. I let off the brake and punched the gas. The tires spun in the mud, getting no traction and my throat began to swell. But the car eventually lurched forward. As I sped off, I looked into the rear-view mirror to see what looked like a pair of white feet, toes pointing down and hanging limp, being dragged into the woods. I continued forward. It had now been well past fifteen minutes, but I told myself that was due to the slow goings at first. As it was now, I was going much too fast. The car bouncing and lurching, and I would surely soon emerge onto the paved road I was told was at the end of this nightmare. The car leapt and crashed to the earth over and over, banging in and out of ditches. Mud was splattered all over the car to the point I could barely see out of the side windows. I would definitely need an alignment after this. Obviously, I'd considered turning around and getting the hell out of there, <laughs> several times damning my foolish pride. But at first, there'd been nowhere to turn around. The road was too narrow. And now, even if there had been somewhere to turn around, I wasn't stopping for anything. My heart fluttered with hope when I noticed a horizontal band of silver cutting across the path up ahead. The road, I said to myself, and continued barreling forward. But relief turned to despair as I neared the wall of false hope. I buried the pedal and plunged headlong into the thick bank of fog. My headlights refracted amongst the moist air, enshrouding me in an aura of luminescence. The fog crashed by like ocean waves as I swam blindly through the sea of mist. For what felt like an eternity, I seemed to glide through the ocean of white. The road was suddenly smooth, and I could no longer feel the ground jostling the car through my feet. The fog was no longer crashing past me, but instead 
seemed to slowly swirl about the car in a way that contradicted the speed at which I was travelling. For one fleeting moment, I was overcome with a feeling of weightlessness, as if I were floating. Out of the swirling mists in front of the car, a shape began to form. It was white, and at first it seemed only part of the fog. But as it grew closer, it was clear that, whatever it was, it was solid. As the shape emerged, it took on a human form, silhouetted in ivory against the grey smokescreen. The body of a man was suspended in front of me, the mist swirling about him in lazy circles. He was naked and his body was completely white, except where there were scrapes and streaks of blood. He hung limp, as if he were strung up by the noose, though I could see no rope. His back was to me, as was his face, on a head twisted completely around. His eyes looked directly into mine, as his lolled head slowly lifted, and his fat, swollen lips curled up into a wicked, mocking smile. As soon as the imagery came clear, once I acknowledged what I was looking at, it was like something clicked. The fog sped by once more, the ground rumbled through my feet, and, abruptly, the car slammed into a ditch that must have been three feet deep. The initial impact smashed my face off of the steering wheel, and I lost control of the car, if I'd had it to begin with. It was the tree that I ran into next, which rendered me unconscious. I awoke to the knocking of the engine, accompanied by the hissing of some unknown vehicular component. The car was smashed, from what I could see, although with the fog, and now the smoke from the engine, that wasn't much. Needles of pain jabbed through my eyeballs and into the back of my skull. It only grew worse when I tried to sit up. Once I managed that, I found myself sitting on the passenger side of the car, with the bitter taste of blood flooding my mouth. The knocking of the engine had died, and the hissing was now little more than a whisper, like the roar of a distant waterfall. Eventually that too died out. The silence grew louder as I pushed myself up further in the seat, my back to the passenger door. Then, with a stabbing pain, the memory of what I had seen shot back into my brain. I swallowed hard, nearly gagging on my own warm blood, and gazed into the deep fog that surrounded me. I felt the need to flee, to run as hard and as fast as I could, but I was dizzy, and my ankle felt as if it might be broken, so I slammed on the door locks instead. Even if I'd been physically able to run, I wasn't about to risk running blindly through the Shroud of Grey, with that... with that demon out there. For what else could it be? As if in answer to my thoughts, the knocking started again. At first I tried to believe it was the engine letting out another death rattle. How I hoped and prayed that were the case but it was too loud, too deliberate, and I could feel the vibrations in my back. Something was knocking on the door. Three slow, firm knocks. I leapt across the car into the driver's seat, and my head swooned from the effort. As I turned to face the passenger door, I thought I heard a low, raspy cackle 
disturbed the great silence of the grey void outside. The sound faded as quickly as it had begun, leaving me doubting whether or not I truly heard it. I held my breath and listened intently to the night. I believe I closed my eyes and prayed that what I'd heard was only in my imagination. A period of inimitable silence followed. A dreadful, unnerving silence. And my senses were so sharp at that moment that I could have heard a whisper miles off. The silence stretched on and on, and just as I'd begun to hope that all was well and truly still, a strange sound slithered into existence. It started as a slow ticking noise, and the hair on my neck stood on end as it grew louder and faster, until it sounded like the warning of a rattlesnake. I clenched my teeth as the horrible sound buzzed through my brain. With my eyes clenched shut, I listened as the rattle, mere feet away became a low, raspy voice that whispered a single word. Delicious. The voice sounded as though it came from within the car, and with a start I opened my eyes. I was struck with terror. Across the car, looking at me through the mud-spattered passenger window, was the snow-white face of an insane-looking man. His hungry eyes bulged with excitement from his bald, moon-like face, the bottom of which stretched into a maniacal black grin, like a huge crater. A long, white tongue flicked out of that dank, cavernous hole, licking at the window, smearing mud up and down. He watched me with cold, unblinking eyes, like a hawk watching its prey. Suddenly, his hands pressed up against the glass on either side of his face, and I thought he meant to break the window. It was the backs of his hands placed against the glass, even though his face was towards me, and I watched as he pushed himself to his feet staring at me until I could no longer see his face above the window. His bare back and buttocks were now exposed to me, the skin, white like ivory, seemed to glow. Long, dirty lacerations extended the length of his backside. I watched as he slowly turned towards me, the front much the same as the back. With a loud thud, the man's hand, if it could be called a man, grasped for the handle of the car door. I heard him let out a rattle of frustration when he found it locked. Again and again, he yanked at the handle, so hard that the car began to shake. I shut my eyes and covered my ears, terrified of what would happen if it managed to get into the car. I sat there shaking from fright and from the motion of the car, listening to the rattle from his breath and from the door handle clacking back and forth. After an eternity of rocking and rattling, I could take no more. I let out a shout with all the strength I could muster. The exertion, paired with my previously suffered injuries, caused me to go light-headed and nearly black out. When I regained my senses, the car was still and the rattling had stopped. I looked up to see the thing, whatever it was, stalking off into the fog, its back to me. Atop its shoulders, bulging eyes stared from a head completely twisted around. As it disappeared into the fog, it gave me a final, wicked grin. Just as it vanished, the fog erupted into a swirling ball of light. 
I look through the rear window to see a pair of lights floating through the fog. The muffled sound of an engine eventually reached my ears, and soon I saw the truck emerge from the mist. It was the men I'd been working with all week, the men from the house. They pulled me safely from my total car and loaded me into the truck. Straight away I was taken to the hospital and treated for a concussion, a fractured ankle and a couple of cracked ribs. I was told to stay home from work for three to four weeks, for the ribs, as my job involved physical labour at the time, and that is what I did. But while I sat at home, recuperating, and not doing much else. I got to thinking a lot about that night, particularly the ride back out of the woods and to the hospital. It seemed to me that the other guys were quite nervous, and though I wasn't paying much attention at all, their conversation on the way back seemed to suggest that they might know a thing or two about what had transpired. I didn't know any of the men from outside of that job, and didn't have any of their numbers or a way to contact them. Nor did any of them stick around to speak to me at the hospital. So, in what was to be the final week of work on the house, I got in my mother's car and took a ride. I found the men there, working, and when they saw me, everyone grew quiet and stopped what they were doing. Jim gave a solemn nod, slowly approached me, and asked that I wait on the porch and let them finish, and then we could talk. The sun was setting by the time the men came out, each of them looking somber and guilty. It wasn't supposed to happen like that, said Jim. I didn't understand. What wasn't? I asked. That night, the accident. We never meant for anything like that to happen. How could we have known? I don't understand. How could you have known what? Why don't you start from the beginning? And so, he did. The night of the accident, Jim and the other guys had planned a little prank for me. The idea was for Jim to send me down the old, creepy road which they refer to as White Hollow Road, which may or may not be its official name, and have Greg, one of the guys we'd work with, lay in the road and pretend to be dead, or jump out in a mask, or <laughs> some such nonsense, in an attempt to scare me, the new guy. Where is Greg, anyway? I asked, realizing I'd not seen him since before I left on the night of the accident. The men again shot each other somber and guilty looks. He never came back, Jim answered. They'd sent him out to wait for me in the woods that night, and he hadn't been seen since. Greg had a radio with him, which he was using to communicate with the guys. In his last transmission, Greg said he could see a body hanging from a tree. Then, he said that it was coming after him. The final transmission had ended in a gut-wrenching cry of terror, before going dead. That was the last they'd heard from him. Shortly after that, the men went to look for Greg, but instead found me. You saw it too, didn't you? Jim asked me. I nodded. You were mumbling on the way to the hospital. Demon, he said. Snake demon. I swallowed hard, remembering the thing's evil grin as it disappeared into the fog. Now, we thought it was just a story, Jim said. How could we know it was true? And so, Jim told me the story of the Serpent Man of White Hollow Road. He told me about the evil-looking tree I'd passed, 
and how it had been the site of innumerable lynchings in the early to mid-1900s. He told me of how the perpetrators of these lynchings would paint their black victims skin white, so that they might go before the Lord in <clears throat> proper fashion. He told me of one particular man who had a love of snakes, and as such was deemed an agent of the devil, for which, along with the colour of his skin, he was condemned to die. The noose was placed around his neck, and the rope tossed up and over one thick branch of the gnarled tree. The other end was tied to the hitch on the back of a pickup truck. Then, as they had done so many times before, the mob of lunatics cheered as the man was hoisted into the air, spinning and kicking his legs while clutching at his throat, as if to tear it open. This time was different, however. Unlike with their previously committed atrocities, this time the Serpent Man did not die. Well, not right away. For several minutes he hung there with his legs pumping one after the other, and his hands clawing at his throat. Foam throffed forth from his white lips as he hissed, like the snakes he so loved. Crowd grew angry and shouted at him to die, but he still refused. One of the mob grew so furious that he jumped into the truck and slammed on the gas. The serpent man jerked upward with a sickening crack of his neck. The driver kept the pedal down, yanking the poor man through the tight elbow of the tree where his neck snapped clean in half and his head spun up on his shoulders. His body was completely shattered as it was hauled through the gauntlet of tree branches and then to the ground below. But the driver did not stop there. He drove for several miles down the road called White Hollow, the battered corpse dragging and bouncing behind him occasionally swinging out to the side to be smashed off a tree. Afterwards, the driver stopped somewhere down the road, untied the pulverized body, and left it to rot in the woods, uninterred. Shortly thereafter, many of the mob would turn up dead along that road, and soon the lynchings, at least in this area, had stopped. Every so often, they'll find a body on the road. But, hey, it's a dangerous road. Things happen. We never actually thought the stories were true, Jim told me. I couldn't believe what I'd heard. I was a little bit in shock, but I had heard him. Heard his voice. The way he'd said those last few words gave me the impression that his opinion had changed. And now? I asked him. The men looked around at each other, and then back to me. And now, Jim said, now we know. The night of the wreck, after they dropped me off at the hospital, they headed back towards the road to search for Greg. They passed the house they were working on, and continued on towards White Hollow. About halfway there, a thin fog had begun to rise off the ground. As they approached the hanging tree, they could see something in the road ahead. It was a man. A white man. Bright white, with a glow like the moon. His bloody, lacerated back was to them. But atop his shoulders, his face stared at them, huge eyes bulging with excitement and dark, black mouth grinning in amusement. In front of him, while he stared on at the men, unblinking, his hands pumped up and down. It was then, Jim said, that he saw the rope in the monster's hand. 
His eyes followed the cord up into the tree, to the other end, which was firmly encircled around Greg's neck, as his limp body was hoisted up into the tree. The men fled back to the house. None of them had spoken of it until now, but they'd all lived in fear since. Greg's body was never found despite several searches of the road and surrounding woods by the local police. I shouldn't have to tell you which way I turned out the driveway that night, and I don't think any of the men ever used that road again. Well, my dear friends, I hope you enjoyed that one. This particular story is dedicated to all of my American listeners, especially those in and around the Pittsburgh area. <laughs> Thank you to all those authors who've either contacted me directly or they've left their stories in the vault. I do my best to get through them, and just to let you know, I really do appreciate it. If you're an aspiring author and you like the way I tell stories, please feel free to post your story on the vault. Okay, have a nice weekend everyone, I'll be back again on Monday. For now, bye bye.